Pearl had heard it said that men who married only once were worth diamonds, and divorcees were worth peanuts. That was why she chose to leave the title of Mrs. Simon behind. She knew that Danny didn't give a damn about being a bachelor or divorcee, but ever since they had met, he had been the one protecting her. She didn't think she had much to give him in return, and so she decided that this would be her final gift to him. Hearing her words, Danny descended the stairs and stretched out a muscular arm, pulling Pearl into his embrace. He kissed her on the top of her head and whispered, It's a quick procedure to get a new birth certificate. We can come back tomorrow. Pearl looped her arms around his trim waist, burying her pale face in his chest. She shut her eyes. I'm sorry, Danny. I'm sorry I can't accompany you in this lifelong journey. Danny held her tightly, wishing that he could hold her until he became one with her. Pearl, you're not allowed to say such nonsense again. We'll come back again tomorrow, all right? How about this? Pearl said smilingly. When I recover, I will come and make our marriage official. If I don't recover, you're not allowed to forget about me, even after you marry another Mrs. Simon in the future. I want you to remember that I'm the one who left behind the title of Mrs. Simon. I want you to cherish me forever. Danny's eyes were bloodshot, and he burrowed his face in her neck. Pearl, don't be afraid. We're not facing the end of our journey yet. Don't lose hope. I will find a way to save you. Nobody can take you away from me. Danny wasn't willing to settle for anything less than her full recovery. Pearl took in his clean, comforting scent before pushing him away. She ran her fingertips over his handsome face. It felt like so long since she had been able to take a good look at his face. He was still as good-looking and charming as ever, and she couldn't help but feel like she was falling for him all over again. Danny, do you still remember the vow you made in your proposal? You said you wanted our relationship to last longer than eternity, that you would hold my hand always and take me with you to the end of this world. Danny took her hand and held it tightly in his. He looked into her watery eyes and asked, Pearl, will you forget about me? She seemed to have forgotten the entire world, with the exception of Danny. He was afraid, so afraid, that she would eventually forget about him too. Pearl was trying her best to engrave his face deep into her memory. She wanted to keep him inside her heart forever, so that his presence would never be diminished, no matter how much time had passed. I'll never forget you, Danny, not in this lifetime. Pearl made her never-ending promise to him. Danny held her in his arms again. Pearl, you must never forget me. You can't. Back at home, Pearl had returned to her bedroom to have a nap. She felt her energy levels depleting rapidly, needed to have a good sleep. In the study... Danny had one hand in his pocket and the other holding his cell phone. The pharmacology research lab had phoned him. Mr. Simon, we haven't been able to develop an antidote for the love pee poison at this stage. Danny pursed his lips. Fine, continue with your research. He hung up the phone. Knock, knock. Davis's voice could be heard from outside. Mr. Simon? Danny placed his phone back in his pocket before answering. Come in. Davis entered the room and placed a stack of documents on the desk. President, I've investigated the matter you entrusted me with. Danny's deep eyes flickered and he reached forward and flipped through the documents in front of him. I've had some investigators look into the hospital that Lady Beatrice gave birth in 21 years ago. Martha coincidentally went into labor at the same time in that same hospital and gave birth to a baby girl. But, Davis continued, I sense something fishy. Martha's childbirth records were intentionally erased. Moreover, someone tried to cover things up, but it only made the issue more conspicuous. Martha's medical records were altered to show that she gave birth at a random hospital in New York. Danny pursed his lips. 
Have you found out who's behind all of this? I've found the culprit, yes. It's your mother. Alana. Danny's expression didn't change. He was sure that his mother had something to do with it, ever since he tested the waters with her at the hospital the other day. He drew his brows together. Jordan Layton had control over the entire city back then. When Beatrice was in labor, he closed off the entire hospital, keeping a tight rein over who came in and out. How was it possible for my mother to pull off such an intricate plan right under his nose? 21 years ago, the Simon family hadn't been that powerful. Danny wasn't convinced that his mother would be able to single-handedly fool a shrewd character like Jordan. Davis nodded in agreement. Just as you suspected, sir, there's another person involved in the operation. Danny lifted his eyes and muttered a name. Lady Beatrice. He wasn't asking for confirmation, but stating a definite answer. Only Lady Beatrice would have the ability to pull off such an operation right under Jordan's nose. Davis nodded. Yes, Lady Beatrice was collaborating with your mother. Danny returned the document to the desk and tapped his fingers on the shiny wood, deep in thought. Why would they choose to do that? Sir, this is a photograph of Lady Beatrice. Davis placed a photograph on the desk right beside Danny's hand. You'll note there's an uncanny resemblance between Lady Beatrice and your wife. Danny lowered his eyes to Beatrice's portrait, and a sardonic smile hinted at the edge of his lips. Pearl is Lady Beatrice's daughter, and Clarice is Martha's daughter. The two girls were swapped at birth. Vincent and Martha must have played a part in the switch, too. The only thing I can't figure out is the reason behind Beatrice's decision. Why would she choose to swap her own daughter? Since even the sagacious Danny couldn't figure it out, Davis didn't bother wasting his precious brain cells trying to come up with an answer. Instead, he said, Jordan Layton's love trial with the Lynn sisters was the topic of much speculation back then. No one knew who Jordan's true love really was, Matilda or Beatrice. My guess is that there's no definitive answer to Lady Beatrice's decision after giving birth. The possibilities are simply endless. The matter of most importance now is that Pearl is the biological daughter of Jordan Layton. She is the true heir of the Layton family. Clarice is merely an imposter, and Martha resorted to such extreme measures to protect her real daughter's treasured status. She's truly evil, trying to disfigure Pearl's face to hide the likeness. We should help your wife regain her rightful status as soon as possible. Danny was deep in thought, and he raised a brow and narrowed his eyes. He was evidently pleased after learning the truth, and Davis's words echoed in his ears on repeat. Pearl is the true heir of the Layton family. 21 years ago in the hospital, he'd been drawn to a newborn baby girl. Her tiny hand had grabbed hold of his index finger, refusing to let go. She had smiled brightly up at him, such a sweet smile. And Danny had been overwhelmed by such a rush of tenderness and love, a powerful mix of protectiveness and vulnerability, that he had never felt before or since. That was until three years ago, when he had met Pearl. The corner of Danny's mouth lifted into a gentle smile. Thank you, Davis. You can head back. I'll take care of this myself from here. A little while later, Danny quietly opened the door to the bedroom. There was only one lamp switched on, bathing the room in a soft yellow glow. Pearl came out of the bathroom in a negligee that fell from her shoulders in a soft waterfall of silk. Her voice was soft and sensual as she spotted him coming in. Did you finish handling your work matters, darling? Danny's steps were wide as he walked up to her and wrapped her waist in his muscular arms. He took two steps forward, sandwiching Pearl between himself and the wall. 
Pearl fixed her gaze on him. Darling, what's the matter? Danny's eyes were concealed in the half-light, but they brimmed with a burning passion. He lifted his right hand and raised a finger in front of her face. He didn't do anything more, just silently waited for her reaction. Pearl looked at the finger in front of her and lifted her hand, lightly tugging on it. Lifting her long eyelashes, she looked at the handsome face in front of her and smiled sweetly. Is something wrong, Danny? Danny's gunmetal eyes flashed and his muscles went tense all over. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, it was her. 21 years ago, the newborn who wouldn't let go of his finger, the newborn who smiled sweetly at him, it was her. 21 years later, she hadn't really changed. When he stretched his finger out, she held on to it without hesitation. She smiled the same sweet smile. For the past 21 years, he had mistaken Clarice for the baby he'd held in the hospital. Clarice had assumed the identity of the daughter of the Layton family. And when Grandpa Layton had teased him one day about marrying Clarice, the young Danny had blushed and run away. When Clarice had grown up, he'd secretly gone to take a look at the woman she'd become. He looked inside himself for the rush of emotion he'd felt as a child, but it was all in vain. And now he knew why. After all the twists and turns, that newborn was actually Pearl. From the day he was born, Danny's life had been beset with responsibility and expectation. With a philandering father and an unhappy, distracted mother, he'd grown up under the hard-headed and ambitious eye of his grandfather, Theodore. Young Danny never knew tenderness. He was never allowed to indulge in vulnerability. No one had ever looked at him with a love in their eyes that was just for him. Danny Simon wasn't lovable. He was valuable. And not for who he was, but for what he could do for others for what he could achieve. He had never known how to do anything other than strive. But the day that little girl had held his finger and gazed up at him, he had felt like her smile was just for him. She didn't know he was Danny Simon, the fetid heir of an ambitious family. And as he held the little girl in his arms, he had felt for the first time in his life the peace and tenderness of a love without expectations. He forgot the responsibility that weighed so heavily on his shoulders, even as a child. After that day, he continued his life as Danny Simon, taking his role as head of not only the family business, but also its hopes and security. He had continued to strive, but he had never forgotten the peace he felt when that baby girl smiled up at him. He had never forgotten the sense of destiny that had pulled him into the neonatal room. He had held that tiny flicker of tenderness inside him all these years, shielding it like a candle in the wind, hoping he would one day find it again. And now, it was right in front of him. He just hadn't been aware of it. 21 years ago, he had lost that baby girl. 21 years had passed, and he had eventually found her again. Pearl. Danny furrowed his brows while kissing her forehead and pressing his body to hers. He wanted to share with her the truth he had discovered, though he knew he couldn't explain it. Not yet. You know you're the only woman I've ever loved, don't you? You're my one and only. You always have been. Pearl hugged his trim waist. I know, darling. You're my one and only two. She didn't know. She didn't know how long he had waited for her. She didn't know how inevitable she had felt to him, like they had been destined to find each other again. The love Danny felt for her was insurmountable, like the endless sea, the highest mountains. My love, I'm sorry I'm late. He really was late. If only Pearl hadn't been swapped as a baby, she would have grown up by his side. She would have been able to protect her. He would have been able to protect her and look over her, 
guaranteeing her a life without worries. They had wasted 20 whole years. 20 years that should have belonged to them. But fate worked in mysterious ways. Three years ago, he had fallen in love with her at their first meeting. He had unknowingly fallen in love, and his feelings had only grown deeper with time. Pearl felt that something was strange with Danny today. His muscles beneath her hands felt as tough as steel. She could feel something brewing within him. She batted her long eyelashes, her eyes suddenly turning red. She was suddenly overcome with the urge to burst into tears. Darling, you're here for me now. It's never too late. We can't do anything to change the past. All I can do is ask that you be there for me for the rest of our lives. For the rest of their lives and beyond that. Danny showered kisses on her forehead. He couldn't seem to stop. One kiss simply wasn't enough. He couldn't figure out why, but he felt his eyes growing moist. This woman had filled up his entire heart. He was happy because of her, but he also felt pain because of her. And I ask you to be there for me, for the rest of our lives too. His lips traveled down, trailing soft kisses until he reached her mouth. Pearl smiled brightly, running her hands up his chest to tangle in his hair. She returned his kiss, forgetting everything else in the world except for the feel of his lips on hers. They broke apart a few minutes later, their faces flushed and both of them breathless. But they were still so close that they could feel each other's heartbeats. Danny ran his hands down Pearl's back and swallowed. Pearl. He knew she'd been feeling weak over the past few days, and he didn't even dare to indulge in their kisses. He was afraid of losing self-control. He wanted to restrain himself, worried that he was asking for too much, and she wasn't strong enough right now. Whenever he hugged her, kissed her, or just after a day of not being able to see her, all he wanted to do was ravish her. She was right. He was just like a wolfhound. The only thing stronger than his desire for her was his need to protect her. But still, it felt a little torturous for him. He wanted her so much, but he was afraid that her body wouldn't be able to handle it. Pearl wrapped her arms around his neck and kissed him with her glistening, swollen lips. Danny... I need you, darling. I'll always belong to you. She buried her face in his chest. I'll always belong to you. She belonged to him and him only. Baby, look at me. Danny kissed her red lips while coaxing her in a soothing voice. Pearl slowly looked up and he pinned her under his heated gaze. Pearl's pale face slowly flushed in two and she bit down on her lower lip. This man was the love of her life. Danny's lips were on hers as he muttered, my one and only. Fate had finally brought them back together. She had given him his purpose in life. An hour later, Pearl was exhausted and she lay in bed with her messy bangs plastered to her warm forehead. The intense activity had depleted her energy levels and sent her right into the land of dreams. Danny covered her with the blanket and leaned over to kiss her delicate face before walking over to the balcony. His open shirt billowed in the chilly wind and he pulled out his cell phone and dialed a number. It rang once before the person on the other line picked up. A nonchalant baritone voice said, Hello, Danny. It was Jordan. Danny's white shirt was untucked and undone, and his brown chest was exposed, giving off an indolent but magnetic aura in the moonlight. His deep eyes focused on the twinkling lights in the distance, and he curled his lips and said, Jordan, do you have any free time? Let's meet. Anything special? Jordan replied with just two words. Actually, yes. Danny gave a similarly succinct word response. 
I'll be attending Xander's engagement ceremony in two days. I'll see you there. See you there. At the ground floor of Miss Travis's apartment block. A Bugatti Veyron gradually pulled up to a stop at the curb. The window rolled down to reveal a handsome, refined face. James had returned. His large palm pressing on the steering wheel, and he looked up at the apartment window. A warm light shone from inside. She was still awake. James took a deep breath. It had been half a month since he had last seen her. He knew that she didn't wish to see him, and so he had gone overseas for work for two weeks. He had asked his secretary to line up meetings one after another, so that he didn't have time to think of her. But he was only deceiving himself. He missed her. He missed her so much he felt like he was going insane. He had driven here as soon as he got off the plane. Would she still hate him when she saw him again? James faintly curved his thin lips. He took another deep breath, opened the car door, and stepped out into the night. Ding dong! Ms. Travis heard the doorbell ring. Who could it be? She hadn't been expecting anyone. When she saw James, her eyes lit up with joy. James, you're back! Ms. Travis, James greeted and entered the house. He asked in a hushed voice, Where's Lana? Seeing how much her son-in-law had missed her daughter, Ms. Travis felt pleased. She pointed down the hall and said, In the bedroom. I'll hand Lana over to you now, James. I've got my line dancing class this evening. Ms. Travis made her way out of the apartment, giving the two of them some privacy. James's footsteps were light and steady as he walked over to the bedroom. The door was ajar, and James saw an exquisitely graceful figure sitting on the bed, her back facing him. He took one glance, and his tall body immediately stiffened. Lana was wearing a pair of white cotton pajama pants and a white tank top. Her hands swept her long hair aside, revealing her graceful back. She furrowed her eyebrows and grumbled, Mom, what are you doing? Quickly, help me clean my back. I don't care what you say, I'm having a real bath tomorrow. I'm telling you, not letting me bathe during my recovery period is just wrong. The idea is old-fashioned and obsolete. Lana had tried to secretly take a bath the day before, but her mother had caught her. Ms. Travis had been watching her like a hawk and said that she would help wash her back. When she didn't hear a response, Lana huffed, but didn't turn her head. Mom, come here quickly, she urged. Come here quickly. The words had a hint of a spoiled child whining, and they entered James's eardrum like a curse. He walked into the room uncontrollably. The basin's there, Mom. James glanced sideways. There was a basin of hot water placed on the chair beside the bed. He walked towards it and squeezed the excess water from the washcloth. He wiped her back clean with gentle ministrations. The wet cloth glided across her smooth skin, leaving tiny droplets of glistening water. The tank top revealed her slender waist, and his eyes wandered over the perfect S-shape of her body. James's throat felt like it was on fire. I'm going to take off my tank so you can do the rest. Don't look. I'm going to take off my tank so you can do the rest. Don't look. Lana could sound like a pampered child when she spoke to her mother, and this idiosyncrasy was in stark contrast to her typical aloof appearance. James pursed his thin lips. He wanted to say something to warn her, but his throat felt so hot he couldn't utter a word. Lana stretched out her arms and pulled off her tank. Even though she thought it was her mother, she still felt embarrassed. After all, she was already an adult. She wrapped her arms protectively around her chest, turned her head and said, Mom, you... Her voice trailed off as she was met by the handsome and refined face of James. He was very tall. She needed to raise her head to look up at him. Now his eyes were fixated on her bright and smooth chest. He was unable to avert his gaze in time, and when he saw that she was looking, he raised his eyes, and his gaze fell on her pretty face. He hadn't seen her for half a month. Under the meticulous care of her mother, she looked to be in good health. Her face was fair, her lips were red, 
and every feature of her face looked enchanting. James's handsome eyes gradually reddened. Both of them exchanged eye contact. The atmosphere in the room became haunted and stifling. When Lana registered his presence, her gaze turned aloof. James licked his dry lips and stuck one hand into his pants pocket. He hoarsely said, Sorry, I... Lana stood up and approached him. She pushed up onto her tiptoes and kissed his lips. James' dark eyes instantly narrowed. He never would have imagined that she would take the initiative to kiss him. She actually kissed him. The feel of her soft and sweet lips brought him back to reality. She had indeed kissed him. James felt his blood boil in that instant. His muscular torso tightened, and he gradually knitted his brows. He gently opened his mouth to take in her red lips. He swiftly knitted his brows. It was not that it didn't feel good, but James dared not touch her. She was still nude above the waist. He didn't know where to put his hands. He pulled back a little and hoarsely whispered, Lana Banana, you're still in recovery. We can't. Lana bit down hard on his lip. The piercing pain was enough to make him lose control. James groaned and wrapped his powerful arms around Lana's slender body, the body he had lusted after for so long. Her skin was as smooth as silk. He strode ahead and the pair of them collapsed onto the soft bed. The mattress was filled with a pleasant fragrance. It was the cold scent that emanated from Lana's body. James kissed her lips and nuzzled into her neck, uttering, Lana Banana, can I touch you? I promise I'll be gentle. His hands started to move upwards from her waist, but Lana's own hand reached out and stopped him. James stiffened. He slowly opened his eyes and gazed into Lana's face. She was looking at him stonily. It was as though a tub of cold water had drenched him from head to toe. His heart turned cold. She didn't close her eyes during the whole process. All she did was look coldly at him while he was in the throes of passion. Her body had already stiffened like an unyielding piece of stone. In the past, she had often been aloof in bed. But when he kissed her, she was still able to tolerate it. Right now, she found his kiss unbearable. Lana placed her hand on his chest and pushed him away. She rolled over and climbed off the bed, tugging her pajama top on. I wanted to try one last time, but it's no use, James. When you kiss me, my whole mind was filled of the image of you pinning down Clarice. This is a divorcement agreement contract. Lana shoved the paper toward James. Please sign it. We don't have children and I don't need your money, so it should be a straightforward enough process. It's time we went our separate ways. James's face darkened. Tears sprang to his cold eyes. She hadn't wanted to kiss him. She just wanted to let him experience how much she abhorred him. He was so passionate towards her a moment ago, and now she had pushed him into a deep, icy abyss. It was then that he realized how much she hated him. He picked up the document and without even bothering to look at it, crushed the paper into a ball and tossed it into the trash can. Clarice and I have done nothing. I will never agree to divorce you. Lana looked at his grim, mullish face, curved her lips and said, James, we're getting a divorce. It'll happen whether you like it or not. James' heart sank and he responded, I know you're harboring secrets. You had better not play games behind my back. Remember, when you were born, you were Mrs. Wright. And when you die, you'll still be Mrs. Wright. He got up and walked out of the room. At the CC bar, James sat at the bar nursing a beer. The counter was littered with empty beer bottles, and he lost count of how many he'd had already. James, why are you sitting there drinking alone? A familiar voice materialized beside him. It was Clarice. The bartender placed a cocktail on the counter, and James grabbed it and downed it in one. He ignored Clarice. Clarice was unhappy. She felt that James was becoming increasingly apathetic, 
pulling further and further away from her. James, she whined, and stretched her hand out to tug at his shirt with the mannerism of a spoiled child. James dodged her hand, not even allowing her to touch the corner of his shirt. His eyes narrowed faintly as he glanced over Clarice, exuding deep displeasure and intimidation. This was the first time he had looked at her like that, with a look so close to revulsion. Clarice retracted her hand and tried to conceal her resentment. She sat by James's side. James, let me drink with you. James suddenly felt a wave of heat rising up within his muscular stomach, making him feel unwell. He abruptly raised his head and glanced at the bartender before him. What was that drink you just gave me? The bartender's eyes met James's frosty gaze. He quivered and pointed to the glass on the counter. It's a one-night stand, Mr. Wright. Didn't you ask for it? One night stand, the same drink Pearl had gotten wasted on before. He had drunk it by mistake, gulping down the entire glass. It was all Lana's fault, making him so confused. He had already tolerated half a month of not seeing her. And when he had finally seen her again, she drenched him with a bucket of cold water. When he arrived at the CC bar, he was filled with fury and had ordered a lot of alcohol. James felt the room starting to spin. He stood up from his bar stool and swayed a couple of times. James, let me help you. Clarice swiftly held his arm. I'll take you to the hotel to rest. In the hotel room, Clarice placed James onto the soft king bed. James was completely wasted and his body reeked of alcohol. Clarice felt lucky. Even the heavens were helping her. She stretched out a finger to stroke James's handsome face. In terms of looks, James and Danny were on par. If she couldn't have Danny, then having James was good enough. Clarice removed her coat, revealing a strappy top and short skirt. She climbed into bed and knelt beside James. James was wearing a white shirt and charcoal pants. His muscles were defined in a way that exuded a whiff of aristocracy, unlike Xander's. A black leather belt encircled his toned waist, and there was a bulge beneath it. Clarice curved her red lips and reached out to loosen James's belt. She would become James's woman after the die was cast. At that moment, James suddenly opened his eyes, and his gaze fell squarely onto her face. Clarice hadn't anticipated that he would wake up. She leaped up in shock, with her hand still on his belt, and smiled seductively. James. James slowly raised his hand and touched Clarice's face. In a daze, he muttered a name. Lana Banana. Lana Banana. Lana. Clarice stiffened. She was so furious, she nearly vomited blood. James was so drunk that he actually thought she was Lana. Lana Banana, it's really you. You've come back. I know you didn't intend to make me angry. Don't mention the divorce anymore. I'll never agree to it. James had mistaken Clarice's face for Lana's. He slowly stroked Lana's pretty face. Lana, I... James stretched out his large palm to hold Clarice's slender arm and forcefully pulled her onto the bed. Oh! Clarice let out a cry. At this moment, James rolled over and pinned Clarice down. He looked at the face beneath him lovingly. Lana Banana, I have something to tell you. I love you. I've loved you for a very long time. I didn't marry you just because of Clarice. I really wanted to marry you. I saw you for the first time years ago and I just couldn't forget you. Please don't divorce me. Please don't do it, Lana Banana. I beg you. I'm really begging you. I did pin down Clarice, but I didn't do anything with her. I know it bothers you. I'm wrong. It was wrong. But I don't know how to make up for my mistake. The clock can't be turned back. Won't you give me one more chance? James's heart felt as if it had been stabbed with a searing hot knife. He realized he was wrong and that he had indeed made a mistake. 
He should never have gone for Clarice. The child was gone, and she would never forgive him. Not only had he lost the angel from his childhood, soon he would lose his wife too. He had a bad premonition that she would leave him very soon. But he loved her. He really loved her. Clarice listened to James' confession and swiftly clenched her fists. She dug her fingernails into her palms and didn't feel any pain. So it turned out that James really did love Lana, and he had loved her for many years. All along, she had thought it was strange. The way that James had been treating Lana was unusual. Now she knew. He had actually been in love with her for years. Clarice's eyes were filled with jealousy, hatred, and an unwillingness to concede defeat. Danny and James were supposed to belong to her. But now Danny had been snatched away by Pearl, and James was being taken away by Lana. In the end, she was left with nothing. Her rich girl status was just a sham. She refused to take it lying down. Clarice suddenly curved her lips. She reached out and undid the button on James's shirt and coyly said, James, I'm Lana Banana. I won't divorce you. I love you too. Tonight I'll give myself to you. Won't you take me? In his drunken state, James's muscular body was restless. And now he felt Lana undoing the buttons on his shirt, asking him to take her. His eyes blazed with desire. Lana Banana, I want you. James reached down and lifted Clarice's skirt. Clarice quietly whipped out her cell phone and switched on the video chat function. In her bedroom at her mom's apartment, Lana's cell phone rang. She glanced down at the screen. Clarice had initiated a video chat with her. What was Clarice up to now? A frosty smile played on Lana's pretty lips. She swiped the screen, accepting the video call. The video chat opened, and Clarice's tender cries were heard. Lana saw a large hotel room bed, a handsome man pinning down a woman, both of them in various states of undress. Lana could see the man's side profile. It was chiseled and handsome, and most certainly that of her husband. Clarice lay underneath him. She looked at Lana through the screen and laughed happily, moaning sensually into James's ear. Lana quivered. Her heart felt like it had been pierced by a needle, and she felt faint pricks of pain. So Clarice had intended for her to watch their live stream action. James and Clarice were having an affair. Again. Lana placed the cell phone on her bedside table. If Clarice wanted her to watch, then she'd watch. She wanted to see James and Clarice rolling about on the bed sheets to see every single detail. It was the only way she could completely eliminate this man from the depths of her heart. Clarice worked hard to put on a good show. She hurriedly straightened herself and reached out to tug on James' leather belt with both hands. James, hurry up. I want you. She pulled James's belt open and yanked his zipper down. Clarice was about to make another move when James suddenly grabbed her hand. He felt his head throbbing in pain from the strong alcohol shots. He dazedly looked at Clarice. Who are you? With Lana watching, there was no way Clarice could say she was Lana Banana again. She hastily threw herself onto James. James? What's the matter? You don't want me anymore. James clumsily rolled off the bed. Who are you? You're not Lana. Lana wouldn't do that. Lana didn't like him to kiss her. She would never initiate any kind of intimacy with him. Clarice's face fell upon hearing this sentence. There was the sound of a faint sneer from the video chat. Clarice stiffened. Lana was mocking her. It was then that James discovered the cell phone by the bed. He hunched his broad body and grabbed the phone. The real Lana's pretty face filled his vision. Instantly, he sobered up. He looked coldly at Clarice, who was still on the bed, and looked back at Lana. He lifted his pants with one hand and explained in a bewildered manner, Lana Banana, listen to me. Things are not how they look. I didn't. Lana stared at James's disheveled state and her lips curved into a frosty smile. You weren't being groped just now? James quickly shook his head. No! Clarice didn't touch him. She really didn't. 
Lana gave a short laugh. The screen went black as she hung up. She disconnected the call. She didn't listen to his explanation. Perhaps she didn't believe that Clarice hadn't groped him. Although Clarice had started to remove his pants, she hadn't actually touched him at all. He hadn't let her. The effects of the alcohol reverberated through his body. He had thought Clarice was Lana. James raked a hand through his neat hair, tugging at it forcefully. What was he doing? How did he end up in bed with Clarice? How had he gone insane? He walked away. Seeing that James was leaving, Clarice jumped up and grasped his arm. James, please don't go. Get the hell off me. James shoved Clarice aside and glowered at her dangerously. If it wasn't for the fact that you saved me when we were kids, you'd already be dead. Get lost. James strode from the room and slammed the door behind him. He had left. He had really left. Clarice felt defeated. Such a good opportunity had presented itself to her. She had been so close to betting James, but she had just lost out. Why was it that she always missed out? And not only that, the truth was, it hadn't really been her who had saved him when they were younger. It had been Lana. If James realized the truth, what would he do? The only reason James was helping her now was because of what happened during their childhood. His heart had been held captive by Lana. There was so much hatred and so much fear. Back in the apartment, Ms. Travis had returned. She filled a small bowl with grapes and took it to Lana. Ms. Travis wondered aloud, Lana Banana, where's James? I thought he was here just now. Lana's back was supported by a soft pillow as she nibbled on the grapes. Mom, I'm going to divorce James. Ms. Travis startled and she immediately chided her daughter. You silly girl, how could you think such nonsense? James is such a good man. Why would you want to divorce him? How are you going to live after getting divorced? You'll never find another man as good as him. Mom, I'm really doing it this time. Don't worry. I'll find you a better son-in-law than James. Lana. Ms. Travis had told her before that she didn't agree with the divorce. Ms. Travis turned around and her body quickly stiffened as she saw a tall man standing by the door. James had come back. She didn't know when he had arrived or whether he had heard the conversation just now. Ms. Travis felt embarrassed. James, you're back again. James's handsome face was emotionless. He felt like he was trapped in a gust of cold air that was suffocating and oppressive. He seemed to be trying hard to suppress his emotions, yet also had an air of indifference. He looked straight at Ms. Travis and said, I'm back. Well, come in, dear. You sleep in here with Lana Banana tonight. I'm going back to my room. Ms. Travis swiftly left. James strode into the room and closed the door with a bang. Lana had just finished her grapes and was now lounging on a soft cushion, leisurely flipping through an entertainment magazine. She didn't look at him at all. The atmosphere was icy cold. James stared at her pretty little face and moved his lips. I drank too much at the bar and Clarice took me back to a hotel room. I mistook her for you. We didn't do anything, Lana. His explanation was hoarse and stilted. I know, Lana replied, the very picture of nonchalance as though she was patronizing him. James clenched his large fists. He stared at her for a moment before turning and heading toward the bathroom. What are you doing? He heard Lana ask. James furrowed his brows and responded, I'm going to shower. You're going to shower or to pleasure yourself. James, don't even take one step into that bathroom. His body was still not back to normal. The effect of the one-night stand was still lingering. The heat thrumming through his blood expressed his need for relief. In one glance, she knew what he was intending to do. James's broad back stiffened, but he continued to make his way toward the bathroom. Lana closed her magazine and walked over, blocking his way. James, don't you understand me? James was engulfed in the cold, fragrant scent from her body. 
His Adam's apple bobbed and his body became rigid. I feel terrible. Please let me use your bathroom. Lana didn't give way. She arched her beautiful eyebrows, and a shadow of a smile played on her lips. James, why are you so lewd now? Lewd? In the eyes of the New York public, Mr. Wright was an honorable aristocrat, the product of an upstanding education and the epitome of decency. But in her eyes, he was obscene. Lana, I am a man. I have physical desires. Pleasuring myself is considered lewd now? Pleasuring yourself is not lewd, but pleasuring yourself at my place in my room is lewd. James's handsome features tightened. He felt thoroughly bullied by her and he couldn't do anything about it. He couldn't scold or hit her and could only let her put him down. Now all the muscles in his body felt rigid. He knew she had the upper hand in this confrontation. He felt like a big boy who was being teased by the girl he adored. He had married his wife, but he could only pleasure himself when he had physical desires. He wasn't resentful about it, but now she wouldn't even allow him to pleasure himself. What should I do then? I feel terrible. James looked at her heatedly. Leave my room. Get out. You can find any woman. Maybe someone like Clarice or Rosalind. Take your pick. Ha! James forced out a cold laugh, and his bloodshot eyes fixated on her. Lana, you can bully me all you want. You think that I can't do anything about it? You're certain that I'll never go and look for other women? You're just taking advantage of the fact that I adore you. You're just taking advantage of the fact that I adore you. Lana heard this statement and curved her pretty red lips. But I don't like you anymore. Whether you like me or not is your own matter. It's none of my business. James's breathing slowed down. The knuckles of his clenched fists cracked audibly. He lost control of his emotions and tried to push past her into the bathroom. But Lana blocked him again. In the next second, James reached out and grabbed Lana's arms, pinning her against the wall. Bam! His large palms hit the wall on the either side of her head. James hunched his broad shoulders and enveloped Lana in his dark, oppressive shadow. He brought his face close to hers and let out a cold laugh. <laughs> Mrs. Wright, I know you don't want me to touch you, and I have never held out hope for that to change. I just want to use your bathroom to seek some relief, but you're even denying me of this. Do you know how annoying you're being right now? Lana smelled the alcohol emanating from his body. He had indeed drunk a lot tonight. Their bodies were practically glued together. His muscular frame pinned against her, and she swiftly arched an elegant eyebrow. Her body became rigid beneath his as the intimate physical contact repulsed her. She felt there was something wrong with her, as she could no longer tolerate a man's touch at all. Her frigidity was getting increasingly worse. James, you dare to touch me? She coolly asked. James felt her body stiffening. He hadn't even done anything, and she was already so cold. But he didn't retreat, pinning her against the wall even more forcefully. He curved his dark lips and sneered, Look how frigid you are. If you were to divorce me, would any man want you? You want to find a man better than me? Lana, when are you going to wake up from your dream? He had heard the conversation between her and her mother when he was standing outside the door. She must be serious about divorcing him this time if she had already informed her mother. Her mother was in poor health, and Lana dared not agitate her unnecessarily. James thought she was being naive, she couldn't even perform the most basic act between husband and wife. What man would even want her? Plato? Lana swept a lock of her hair from her face and tucked it behind her ear. She shoved him back and said, I don't need you to worry about what kind of man I'm looking for. Let go of me. Her soft hand brushed against the tight and defined muscles on his body. His eyes swiftly reddened and he trapped her between his chest and the wall in a domineering manner. I'll never let you go, Lana. You belong with me. Lana realized this man was not only lewd, but insane. 
she already allowed him to go and find other women. What was there to be unhappy about? What was the point of suppressing himself like this? James's eyes were desperate as he pinned Lana against the wall. Lana turned her head to the side, refusing to look at him. James grasped her face, forcing her to look at him. His voice was hoarse, his breath hot against her cheeks. Lana Banana, just stay with me. When I'm around, no man will ever dare to come near you. I'll take care of you. I don't care if you don't want to be intimate with me. I promise I won't force you. It's enough just to be by your side. James, Lana said through gritted teeth. Listen to me. I don't want you. It's not enough just to be by my side. You know it's not. You want my body too. I don't want that, and I don't want you. Just let me go, damn it. James glowered at her, and a faint smile played on his lips. You're being unreasonable, Mrs. Wright. I gave you everything in the past, and you didn't seem to hate it so much then. Lana's eyebrows furrowed, and she retorted, And I've given back more than what you gave me, haven't I? She had given back the seed that he had sowed. Their child was gone. Lana had called out the elephant in the room, and the ambiguity in the air disappeared without a trace. James's handsome face fell as he remembered the child that they had lost. The child that was the source of the aching pain in his heart. Not only that, but now he knew she was likely to miscarry again in the future. No one had told her yet. Perhaps she would never have the privilege of becoming a mother. James's heart felt like it had been stabbed. He could still remember when they were at the Borgata. He had kissed her so passionately till her face was flushed and she became breathless. At that point in time, she still had feelings for him. It was him who had caused her to be in this state now. I've already given up my child for you, and you're still refusing to leave? Do you want me to return this set of pajamas to you too? Lana raised a hand and started to unbutton her pajama top. The shirt was peeled apart, revealing her smooth skin. James's dark eyes narrowed at the sight of it, and he sucked in a deep breath. Suddenly, everything went black. Lana had tossed the shirt onto his head, blocking his vision, before pushing him out of the room. He heard the sound. He heard the sound of the door slamming shut. James was left alone in the hallway. His whole mind was filled with the scene he'd witnessed just now. Her pajama shirt was still on his head, and he swallowed as he breathed in the addictive scent of her body. He pulled the shirt from his head and held it to his nose. All he wanted was to feel her in his arms as he hugged her to sleep. Xander and Amelia's engagement banquet was being held at the Carlisle Hotel. The setup was extravagant, overflowing with opulence and grandeur. Amelia wore a white v-neck gown. Her hand was wrapped around Xander's strong arm as she received the blessings of their many guests. Among the guests were dozens of young lady from prestigious families. These women secretly gazed at Xander, sizing him up with both lustful desire and despondency at his engagement. Today, Amelia had broken the hearts of countless young women in the city. What was so special about Amelia to be able to bag Xander Layton? Xander's admirers were filled with envy and hatred. Amelia glanced at the man beside her. Xander was wearing a tailored suit with a crisp white shirt. His short hair was swept neatly upwards, revealing his full forehead, and his features appeared handsome and defined under the bright light of the dazzling chandeliers. Amelia felt her heart palpitate with excitement. Xander typically dressed in all black. This was the first time she had seen him wearing a white shirt, and truth be told, he looked even better for it. This was a man who'd become a gangster in his teens. He was unruly and dangerous, and had experienced the vicissitudes of life. Dressed in white, he exuded a chilling and powerful masculine charm. 
Amelia wondered if the man in all black was merely a facade, while the one beside her now was his true self. He was a silent and awe-inspiring man. Amelia gently squeezed his strong arm and laughed softly. <laughs> Sander, how many fairs did you have in the past? Look how despondent all the women here are, as if their hearts have just been broken. I've just become public enemy number one. Xander stuck one hand in his pocket. He had just ended a conversation with the chief executive, and he turned his face to the women beside him before raising his eyes to survey the room. Those young ladies met his gaze. Some were shy and blushed, and some were bold and resentful. The way things were, it seemed like everyone here had been involved with him before. Xander curved his lips and smiled. He didn't remember all these women. Perhaps he had been with a few of them in the past, but he didn't care about them very much. Xander lowered his gaze and looked at Amelia. He laughed nonchalantly. I've lost count of how many affairs I've had. If that bothers you, you're free to leave. Amelia stiffened. This man was truly heartless. She had just got engaged to him today, but he was still giving her permission to pull out. His flippant attitude was disheartening, to say the least. In truth, Amelia knew that he didn't love her. He just wanted to get married, and she happened to be the one who had appeared at the right time. Amelia's eyes sparkled. This was a man with so many sides to him. She wondered if anyone truly understood him. But the more enigmatic he was, the more she liked him and wanted to conquer him. Oh, I'm not going anywhere, Xander. I want to be your fiancé, and I will become your wife in the future. But you have to promise me, from now on, there will only be one woman. And that one woman is me. Xander lowered his gaze and looked at the glass of red wine in his hand. He lazily swirled the thick red liquid and faintly muttered, Hmm. Amelia took it as confirmation and laughed happily. This man was a man of his word, and she knew he would keep his promises. Amelia knew from experience that when a man and a woman were passionately in love, the man could engage in sweet talk and make endless promises. But the majority of these were a sham. Eventually, most men would stray toward temptation. Xander, on the other hand, had seen the world in its entirety and possessed everything he desired while he was young and frivolous, including power, fame, wealth, and women. Although he was not perfect, he was a trustworthy man. Once he had chosen a woman, she would be the only woman in his whole life. He was a man with many vices and flaws, but the one thing that was clean about him was his heart. His heart which had been hardened by the ravages of time and vicissitudes of life, had never been touched by any woman before. Deep down, he wanted to know what it was to adore someone. He wanted to experience what it was to be in love. At this point, he heard a commotion and someone said, Quick, come see. Danny and Pearl Simon have arrived and Miss Ginny is also here. Ginny. This name made Xander's face twitch. He turned his broad, muscular body around and looked towards the door. Danny entered holding Pearl's hand, and they were followed by Jenny. Wow, Miss Jenny is so pretty. Her and Pearl together are like a beautiful painting. All eyes are on them. I think this is the first time Jenny's made a public appearance. I suppose she's old enough to formally enter the ranks of the social elite now. Wow, what a ravishing beauty. She's going to have the sons of every prestigious family in the city at her heels. As Xander saw Jenny, shock flashed across his brown eyes. Jenny was wearing a flowing ivory dress, and her long hair curled freely around her face. Her eyes were icy cold, and her features looked like they had been exquisitely drawn by an artist. Her skin was dewy, and she glowed with a breathtaking beauty. Up till now, she had always worn loose baggy clothing, 
and this was the first time she had been seen in an outfit that accentuated her slender figure. Xander's eyes swept over her from head to foot, and he felt his mouth turn dry. Xander, I wish you a happy engagement, Danny said as he walked over. Xander curved his thin lips. Thank you, Danny. Danny, this is... Pearl was confused. Pearl, this is Xander Layton. Xander glanced at Pearl and knew she was starting to lose her memory. The final effect of the love pee poison was amnesia, followed only by death. At the pause in the conversation, another CEO chimed in. Miss Ginny, we're all here to celebrate Mr. Layton's engagement today. Have you brought a present for the happy couple? Ginny walked over and arrived at Xander's side. She looked at his handsome face and said with a delicate smile, Of course I've prepared a present. Well, show us. We're all dying to see it. The crowd gathered around Xander and laughed. I can't tell all of you what it is. I can only reveal it to Xander. Her words only made everyone even more eager, giving rise to an air of mystery. Mr. Layton, Miss Ginny wants to tell you all about the present. Quickly, hear her out. Xander's brown eyes landed on Ginny's beautiful face. He didn't budge. Ginny took the initiative and tiptoed at his side. She leaned against his muscular body. Xander could smell the faint, sweet scent from her body. But beneath that, there seemed to be another unique smell coming off of her. Xander's nose wrinkled. He sniffed again, but scent seemed to have disappeared. Ginny's lips were beside his ear. Her voice was so soft that only he could hear her when she said, Xander, do I smell nice? Xander's thick eyelashes moved a little, and his eyes blazed coldly. There was something off with the way she smelled. It's my present for your engagement, Xander. Aphrodisiac scent. Jenny stepped back and walked away. Xander glared viciously after her. She was outrageous, turning up to his engagement banquet, wearing a drug designed to lure him to her. Xander felt his body gradually starting to feel warm and restless within. Mr. Layton, shall we commence the engagement banquet? A staff member came over to ask. Xander tried to suppress the rising heat within his body and said, Let's wait a while. Jordan's still not here. Danny looked down at his watch on his wrist. Jordan should have arrived already. He gently squeezed Pearl's hand in his. Pearl, are you cold? Today, Pearl was wearing a long pink dress with her silky black hair hanging in loose waves around her shoulders. She looked at Danny with her bright eyes and gently shook her head. I'm not cold, but darling, how long are we going to be here? She wasn't enjoying being out. It was so boring and she didn't recognize anyone there. Danny's low and irresistible voice was laced with tenderness and adoration. Very soon, just hold on a little longer, Pumpkin. Time went by, but Jordan was still nowhere to be seen. It was already past the time they had arranged to meet. The distinguished guests were flummoxed. Xander pulled out his cell phone and dialed Jordan's number. The phone rang once before the person on the other line picked up. Hello? It was not Jordan's voice. It was Clarice's. Hello, big brother. I'm sorry, but my father and I can't attend your engagement banquet. We're at the airport and are about to fly home, Clarice said. Danny overheard Clarice's voice, which radiated faint excitement and happiness. As long as she flew away, she wouldn't have any more worries. Danny arched an eyebrow and his lips curved into a derisive smile. Understood. Xander promptly hung up the phone. Mr. Layton, would you like to commence the banquet now? It was getting late. Xander's Adam Apple bobbed and his muscular torso became increasingly numb. The aphrodisiac scent on Jenny was too strong and he found his heavy control threatening to shatter into nothingness. Just give me a few minutes, I need to go upstairs, Xander said in a nonchalant manner before he strode from the room. In his hotel room upstairs, Xander kicked open the bathroom door. He gripped his cell phone and rasped into the speaker. 
Billy, get me an antidote. I've been drugged with aphrodisiac scent. He hung up the phone and threw it on the counter before pulling off his shirt and pants and standing under the cold shower. Billy would need some time to concoct the antidote. In the meantime, Xander needed to cool himself down. The icy water hit his defined muscles. The droplets cascaded down his muscular chest and trickled into his eight-pack and the V-cut of his pelvis. It was a provocative scene. If the women downstairs could see him like this, all hell would break loose. After showering for a few minutes, he felt somewhat better. Turning off the tap, he stepped out and wrapped a towel around his muscular waist, walking out of the bathroom. He stepped into the bedroom, and his broad body promptly stiffened. Jenny had come. He didn't know when she had arrived. Had she been waiting here the whole time? Rage flashed across Xander's eyes. He glared at her ferociously and moved his lips into a snarl. Get out! Jenny's icy cold glaze slid from his handsome face to the towel wrapped low around his waist. Little beads of water clung to Xander's bronze skin, and his hair was hanging loosely in his brown eyes. Jenny's gaze was fixated on him, and he turned so that his back was facing her and she couldn't see him. Jenny walked over and stretched out her arms to hug his muscular back. Her delicate scent wafted from behind him. Xander felt like his throat was on fire. Shit! So much for the cold shower. Jenny, I will only say it one more time. Get out! If you don't, I will get someone to throw you out. Before he could complete his sentence, he felt a gust of cold air down below. The towel wrapped around his waist had been snatched away. Xander's breathing hitched, and a terrifying rage ripped out from his chest. He turned around and glared at her. Jenny backed away, clutching his towel in her hands. The chandelier in the room dazzled over her face, accentuating the softness of her features. She arched her beautiful eyebrows and said bluntly, Xander, you're naked. Xander balled up his large fists and uttered through clenched teeth, Give that back! Jenny held up the towel, her voice challenging. You want this? Well, then come here and take it. Xander stared at her for a moment before striding over. He reached out to snatch the towel back. Give it to me! No, you can't have it. Jenny spun round as Xander's strong arm grasped the towel in her arms. Her movement caused him to end up hugging her from behind. Her body collapsed into his embrace without any warning, and he stiffened completely. Rage peaked in his chest. Jenny softened her body and leaned backwards, nestling into his embrace. She fluttered her long eyelashes and gently said, So many women have thrown themselves at you, and you didn't reject their advances. I'm old enough now to fight them for you. I don't know how to keep you by my side. You're always pushing me away. Jenny didn't like seeing him with other women. There were always so many women who threw themselves at him. All those years ago, she had stood at his bedroom door and seen him and another woman in bed. His forehead had been sweaty and he had panted vigorously. His face a picture of ferocity and self-indulgence. She could see the pleasure in his eyes. She wished she were older so that she could make him happy too. Now, Jenny nestled into him as Xander's muscular chest rose up and down. Her loose hair caressed his handsome face, and it tickled his jaw. Xander's palms were hanging by his side, and he felt them starting to sweat. He couldn't control himself anymore, and he lifted his arms to hug her. He hugged her so tight. He buried his head deep into her neck and breathed her in. All he wanted was to hold her for a very long time. Jenny turned round and released her hand and the towel fell onto the carpet. She stretched her hands up around his neck, then stood on her tiptoes and kissed him. Xander kissed her back with the ferocity of a jackal, fulfilling her deepest desire. 
Jenny became breathless. She felt like he was going to suck out her very soul. Her face started to redden, and she gasped. Hmm. Hmm. At the sound of her voice, Xander sobered up in the blink of an eye and swiftly released her. Jenny gasped for breath, her lips swollen from his kiss. She looked at him with bright eyes. She had so much to say to him, but she was unable to express herself. Xander slowly stepped back. He could no longer be so self-indulgent. Jenny wouldn't have a future if she were to follow him. He turned around to leave. How could he have so much perseverance? He had been drugged, and he was still able to resist her, even though he was facing her head on. Jenny ran to him and hugged him again, pushing him backwards. Xander fell onto the sofa. Jenny climbed onto his muscular thighs and sat down. Xander, I have something to show you. She raised her hand to pull down the left strap of her dress, revealing a wound on her chest. The skin had been stabbed and splattered with drops of acid, leaving a scar. Now the scar had become an eagle. She had tattooed a soaring eagle over her wound. Xander, do you like it? This is you. In my heart, you're a soaring eagle. Now I have you etched on my heart forever. Xander looked at the tattoo. The eagle spread its wings across the fair skin of her chest. It was like raw ferocity juxtaposed against the gentleness of pure snow. He didn't think a tattoo would suit her, but when he saw it there on her skin, he was surprised at how much it looked like it belonged there. Xander felt as if someone had tossed a stone into the calm waters of his heart. Waves rippled out, and Xander slowly raised a finger to stroke the eagle tattooed on Jenny's chest. Jenny raked her fingers through his short, wet hair and placed her lips onto his forehead. She trailed kisses down to his eyes. Xander, this is your home. Let me give you a home. Home. Xander heard the unfamiliar word and let his eyes fall closed. Home. Where was his home anyway? Xander, Jenny said quietly, please don't get engaged to Amelia. I'll give myself to you in place of your engagement banquet, okay? She was methodically attacking the defenses of his heart. Xander's brown eyes were bloodshot. She was seducing him intentionally, and he couldn't withstand the temptation any longer. His body melted into the sofa, and his strong arms spread across the backrest. His entire body felt terrible. Jenny, you're almost 19, and I know you think you're an adult now, but I'm 35. His voice was hot and hoarse, as though his throat was full of coals. Jenny kissed his lips. Xander, I have leukemia. I'm not sure how much longer I'll live. Who knows, I may die tomorrow, or maybe in a month, or a year. Let's just enjoy the present and not worry about the future. You like women, don't you? I'm a woman now too, you know. Enjoy the present. Could he really think so simply? Xander wrapped his large palms around Jenny's waist and furrowed his brows as his gaze trailed down from her eyes. He leaned forward and kissed the eagle on her chest. Moments later, footsteps were heard outside the door, followed by Amelia's voice. Have you seen Mr. Layton? Mr. Layton is in the suite, madam, a staff member responded. Thank you. Amelia placed her hand on the doorknob. She tried to open the door only to find it had been locked from inside. She had realized that Jenny was also missing, and she was filled with a bad premonition. Amelia had always felt that the relationship between Jenny and Xander was bizarre. She had seen how Jenny had chased after Xander's car and the way that Xander watched her. Xander was missing. Jenny was also missing. And now his sweet door was locked from the inside. Amelia stiffened and abruptly knocked on the door. 
Xander? Are you in there? What are you doing? Why have you locked the door? Is someone in there with you? Xander's body became rigid at the sound of Amelia's voice. Jenny's dress had been swept up by him, and her beautiful face was flushed, her lips swollen from their fervent kisses. It was as though a tub of icy cold water had drenched Xander from head to toe, and he instantly sobered up. What the hell was he doing? He abruptly lifted Jenny off his lap and stood up, but Jenny leapt at him and threw her hands around his neck, her long eyelashes fluttering and her eyes turning red. Xander, don't leave me. Xander picked up the towel on the carpet and wrapped it around his waist. He licked his dry lips and said hoarsely, Jenny, I don't want this. Go and live your life. You're lying. You do want this. You want me. Xander's breathing was rapid as his bloodshot eyes flickered. Amelia's voice came through the door again. Xander, is there a woman in there with you? Have you forgotten your promise to me? Our engagement banquet is today. Xander. Jenny hugged him tightly, fearing that he would open the door for Amelia. Please don't get engaged. I'm already yours. I'm already yours. Xander knew he had to call off the engagement. He had wanted to heed Jordan's advice. It was true that he was getting older, that he should find someone suitable to start a family with and try to forget Jenny. But now he realized that it was impossible. He couldn't forget her. Wherever and whenever she appeared, he would always be drawn to her, like a moth to a flame. If that was the case, he wouldn't get married. Amelia was a good woman and he didn't want to hurt her, but he wouldn't be with Jenny either. He had been caught up in the throes of passion just now, still addled by the effects of the drug Jenny wore. It was the first time in years that he'd lost himself like that, but now... He had regained his clarity of mind. The best thing he could do was stay single. If he didn't get attached to anyone else, he wouldn't end up hurting anyone else. Being single for the rest of his life wouldn't be so bad. He reached out to help Jenny straighten her clothes. He tried his best to avoid looking at her and to forget what had happened just now. Jenny, listen to me. Nothing happened. You're not mine. Just now, I, I'm sorry. Please forget about it. The blush on Jenny's face swiftly disappeared, leaving her ashen. She looked at him and asked in a shaky voice, Xander, you, you don't want me anymore? Xander's throat bobbed and he could barely even hear his own low, hoarse voice. He didn't know what to say. Jenny, go back to your big brother. Start a new life. Forget me. Forget me. Jenny fluttered her long eyelashes and punched Xander's shoulder. Tears streamed down her face as she glared at him. Asshole! You absolute asshole! Xander didn't move as she pummeled him. Jenny punched and kicked and shouted, What is this? Xander, I'm yours. You pull me in and then push me away over and over. You're a jerk. You just like playing with people's feelings. Jenny continued to hit and scold him. Suddenly, she dropped her fists and hugged Xander tightly. She wrapped her body around his like an octopus. Xander, I want to be with you. I'm not going anywhere. If you don't want me anymore, I'll... I'll kill myself. Xander stiffened. That way, everyone will deem you a beast. They'll think that you drove me to my death. You think you can just walk away from me, do you? I won't make it that easy for you.